So good evening, everyone. Um, lovely to have you with us. Um, this is our last panel discussion for emboldened menopause conversations we all need to have. And it's on the theme of creativity. And we have a guest panel. We have three of our guests here now. We have Karen Strock, Emily Steinberg and Carol Russell. We're hoping that Arzu Kadri will be able to join us later on. Um, but um, for now, we're going to start with some introductions. So um, I'm just going to run through our amazing panel. So acclaimed screenwriter, Carol Russell's credits include writing one of the multi award winning and BAFTA nominated series, Soon Gone, A Windrush Chronicle, and being part of the BAFTA winning team behind the story of Tracy Beaker, the TV adaptation. Her screenplay, House of Usher, was one of six short films made by Crucial Productions for the BBC, and her monologue, Horns of a Dilemma, was broadcast on BBC Radio 4's Women's Hour. Carol has worked in development with three production companies and has been accepted on the Criterion Theatre New Writing Programme. Very warm welcome to you tonight, Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Thank for you being very here. much. Thank you. So Emily Steinberg is an American artist, writer and educator whose work has been shown across the US and Europe. Her short comic, Blogging Towards Oblivion, was included in The Moment, published by HarperCollins, and she has had a cartoon accepted for the New Yorker magazine. Emily is the first artist in residence at Drexel College of Medicine in Philadelphia, where she works with medical students to translate their experiences into words and images. She's a lecturer in fine art at Penn State University Ab Abington College. Welcome tonight, Emily. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And writer Karen Strock is equally at home with a paintbrush and canvas, needle and thread, or hammer and nails. Luckily, she didn't listen to her college professor who told her that she wasn't a writer. She's best known for her groundbreaking book, Married Women Who Love Women, now in its third edition. But she has written widely, including a recipe book, a rhyming children's picture book, the mystery novel, In the Shadow of the Wonder Wheel, and also a writer's journey, what to know before, during, and after writing a book. Thank you very much for being here, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. So we're talking about creativity tonight. Um, and all of you obviously have taken that creative work into the outside world, as well as it being your own personal creativity. Um, but I particularly wanted to relate it to menopause as a time of change. So we've talked about menopause in the book, various writers in it, including myself, have talked about it as a time of confusion, uh, rage. Uh, people can even find them closing in on themselves. Um, but it can also be a time of incredible energy and creativity. So I wanted to ask each of you in turn, What's your own experience of that creative energy that menopause can bring, um, both personally and perhaps other people you've worked with or spoken to? Um, and I wondered, Carol, if we could begin with you, because you speak so eloquently in, in your chapter about the artist Faith Ringgold and how she worked through her menopause. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about her and, and then about what, what you've done through menopause as well. Okay. Um I went, to, I was lucky enough to go to see her exhibition last year at the Serpentine and mm. it was amazing. I'd seen a couple of her pieces before and I'd seen uh, in real life and I'd seen a couple of um, articles with pictures of her work, but to be able to stand in front of that work and really allow it to wash over me was, a, was an absolute privilege. Mm. And to know her story and to know how hard she worked and how, she, how hard she fought for women and the mm. and women artists and our work and our, our right to own the space in which we stood as creatives and to see what happened to her over the years and how she was being put, she was pushed 
literally to one side and how she fought that. Mm. And standing in front of uh, uh, her work in that exhibition, it was a real journey through her, her life as an artist. Mm. And I just found it, it was like food. It was mm. food for my soul. I went twice because I just, I needed to do it again. Um, so for me, she, uh, she gave me more permission, if you like, to, um, to allow my creativity to just come out and not, not apologize for it, not try to quash it down, not worry about the younger women coming behind me and you know making space for them, but taking my own space. Mm -hmm. And so, what what have you has your creativity changed during menopause? What what have you found? What and what 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 has shifted? Where did you put your energy? At okay, this time? I I think. When I started my menopause, that was, you know, when, when the rage came, oh, I'm sorry. When the rage came. Um, no. <laughs> Go away. There. Uh, where am I now? There I am. Yes, when, when the rage came, I part of the rage was being a black uh, woman, screenwriter there were there were very few people who looked like me actually doing the work at that particular time as i was entering my menopause and i was furious i was absolutely furious and i thought okay i can sit here and be furious or i can try and do something about it so i set up my company fresh voices and went out to to find women who like were like me, um, Asian women, uh, Middle Eastern women, and give us a space where we could show our work and I could amplify the work of those, those women, uh, both in television and um, more recently in theater. So that's it. So in terms of how it affected my my uh, creativity, it was kind of, it didn't affect my ability to create work. And in fact, things would just drop into my head. And I, I you know, and that's my experience of my creativity as well. Things just drop into my head and I go, oh yes, that seems like a very good idea. It was more to do with creating space for others to also uh, create. That was yeah. what was important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, that is that's really interesting. So it's like it's bringing other people into that space. Definitely, definitely. I mean, that's something I think we'll come back to a bit later on. Thank you, Carol. Um, Emily. So, what was your what's been your personal experience of of menopause and creativity? So, obviously, you've done the wonderful central pages in the book, the the little graphic short graphic piece in there. Um, and you've um, drawn also in other places around the theme of menopause. So what, what did it mean for you? What did it, what did it do for you? So um, I think it, I found it to be incredibly freeing the entire experience because like I wrote in my little um, story for the book, the history of women has basically been sort of are following this biological function. And throughout history, women are sort of like, that was it. That was kind of, you know, one and done. You do your biological bit and then you're sort of put out to pasture, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that's just not the case. I mean, for me, and, and I, I feel really fortunate to be born in such a, in this time period, because my life is really, I just keep getting more and more creative and more and more vital and more and more energetic and, so much more centered in what I'm doing than I ever have been in my entire life. And I can really respond to what Carol was saying, where I feel like I now have my own permission, whereas before I was kind of asking people for permission to do things, and particularly men, 
and caring about their responses. I just don't care anymore. And I've totally found my own center. And I don't know if that's about menopause. I don't know if it's about maturity, but I really like it. Mm. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that is really interesting because there's so much in our culture which talks about the young artist, the young writer, and actually hearing this idea that that creativity can actually, we can become more creative as as we grow older. I think that's, that's a really important point. Um, perhaps I could come to you now, Karen, um, and ask you your experience. Uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I don't know if anyone can see me. I've just come on live. I'm so sorry I'm late. That's okay. So yes, just before we go to Karen, if I could introduce Arzu Kadri. Arzu, I'm going to um, ask Karen the question and then come back to you. And I sure, can give a I hope you can see me. I wasn't sure what was happening. I could see and see everyone. I didn't know if anyone could see me. Yeah, thank you okay, very that's much. Brilliant. Okay. So it's working. Apologies yes, it for is. Being late. That's okay. No problem. These things happen. It's all fine. So we're just talking about um, menopause and and creativity. So I'm, I was going to ask Karen, and then I'll come back to ask you the question as well. So okay. So Karen, if you could say, you know, did you find the same thing as as Emily has done? What I found is I have a lot more confidence in myself. Mm. And like Emily, Emily said, I don't really care what people think anymore, what other people think. But my, my journey started before I had menopause. Mm. I had discovered myself and um, I was with a friend and I fell in love with her. And I went through this, is it her, is it me, am I a lesbian? And that led me to write the book that I wrote, Married Women Who Love Women, which began as a catharsis for myself. And what happened is over that first year or so, when I was coming to terms with who I was, I felt like a giant balloon, like ready to pop with a tiny little pinhole and stuff was just coming out and mm. coming out. And when all that stuff came out, then I was me. And so when I went through my menopause, I had a very, very easy time. I've spoken with numerous women who have actually made the same kind of discoveries. If something traumatic happened to them earlier, chances are later on their menopause was easier. But women who have never gone through that traumatic event had a more difficult menopause. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. <clears throat> Definitely. And uh, well, just to, to add to that, most of the women um, in my book, mm. found out about themselves while they were going through menopause. But that also happens to be the time when most children are grown, um, women have more time to themselves, they may be going back to school and they may be questioning more. Mm. And when this happens at the beginning, you feel very thin skinned, very um, mm. emotional, a lot of the women. And when they started really going into themselves, they discovered things they had never thought about before, maybe because they had no time because they were busy raising families. But now for the first time, they had time for themselves yeah. and they started using it well. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there are things which are about mm -hmm. life stage as well as hormone stage in that case, Absolutely. really, aren't there? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, that it's, you know, in the medical terminology, we tend to think of menopause as, you know, when, when the periods stop, when the estrogen stops, but there's also a particular, that midlife time of life, which can involve a rethinking of oneself that then can also be a kind of a wellspring for creativity as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. It's, it's difficult to put a finger on it because a period comes flat, you see the blood, you know what you have. Mm -hmm. menopause takes so many different forms and, and comes over such a, a long period of time mm. that it's difficult to say this is when I became more creative yeah, yeah. but I can yeah. say I became much more comfortable with myself mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely thank you Karen <clears throat> yeah lots to think about there so to introduce Arzu to everyone um so Arzu Kadri is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, presenter, and activist. She has worked extensively in fashion, 
including hosting her own weekly fashion news show. Born in Africa, her first documentary, My Afghan Diary, on her return to Kabul. The film has won multiple awards, including Best Documentary in the Festival del Cinema de Salerno. Arzu has also given speeches about the importance of women's health in Afghanistan and received an honorary award at the Women Appreciating Women Awards. So Arzu, I suppose you'll have a slightly different perspective, but I wondered if you could speak about maybe some of the women that you've interviewed and come across in Afghanistan who are maybe older, maybe going through menopause and what, you know, what you've found about the creativity of the women that you've met and talked to. First of all, thank you very much for having me. Greetings to all of you from a beautiful Hamburg. It's been a bit cold today, but then in the afternoon, the sun came out, which was beautiful. And apologies again for being late. I'm not very good at technical stuff. So it was a real, it was a real struggle. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you, by the way, so much, Caroline, for this beautiful book. I received it only two days ago. Yeah. I'm so grateful to you and, and everyone who has contributed to this book. And um, yeah, from a... Um, well, it's a bit of a long story, but from a, a, f a filmmaker's point of view and activist, um, you know, I've always, uh, I was raised in, in the Western law. I lived in London for many, many years and I was raised in Germany. But however, my roots were always uh, Afghanistan. And for the first time since childhood, September 2017, I flew to Kabul to, first, uh, to film mm -hmm. my first ever documentary. And I would really, if someone was to ask me, who are you? What kind of person are you? And what do you really want to focus on? Is to not to sort of, you know, to, to make the impossible possible for women. And menopause is something in Afghanistan that is a bit of a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. And I always like touching on topics that are taboo because they those taboo things need to be broken. They need to be, uh, they need to be talked about. And just generally speaking, I think in most Muslim countries, uh, it's a topic. Um, I mean, I, I have grandmas, I have aunties who are, all, you know, a lot older than me or my own mother who's been through menopause and who has told me stories but they would share it in a very intimate way if it's one or two close family members they wouldn't sort of really go on and write in a book or yeah. or share their feelings and thoughts so it's something that is actually taboo so I'm really happy that those three Afghan women who have contributed who have um, yeah. I've actually contacted them and asked them and um, it actually took me by surprise Caroline I must say that uh, mm -hmm. all of them had um, confirmed Nur Jahan, Mauluda and Diba both of them were also in my film they opened up even though they didn't feel like they could really they could say everything but they tried their best and mm -hmm. and I think it's we have to start somewhere and yeah. and and this is something another topic that I feel from a woman point of view, all of us, the more we are, the better, because we can together, uh, you know, make make women talk about it. But this is something, it's like it's like getting your period as well. If a young girl in Kabul, if she gets her period, you you would never go to your dad or your dad who shouldn't even know about it and, and let alone menopause. So it's, it's actually a taboo topic to put it yeah. this way. Yeah. So I wanted to, one of the other things, you know, it would be good to talk about this evening is um, what can creative work do to challenge stereotyped views, stereotyped views of women, stereotyped views of older people, stereotyped views of menopause? Because I know, Azu, in your work, you're kind of challenging some of the stereotypes and media ideas of Afghan women. So could you tell me something about maybe just a few of the women that that you met in making my Afghan diary and the ways in which they are challenging stereotypes and the way in which you were able to challenge those through your film? I mean, the challenge was really for them to open up. Mm. That was the biggest challenge actually. Yeah. For us in the Western world, it may be very simple to talk about your feelings or emotions, but the biggest challenge for them, because even though I'm a woman myself and from a woman to woman, you feel more connected because we have the same feelings and emotions. But uh, obviously what I what I had done in regards to my film, there were seven women, including one of the 
probably the most famous female rapper of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Shezaha is her name. She also has a Wikipedia page and she's also in my film and how she was treated by being the first female rapper. Mm. But for me to really make them open up was really to have like a intimate one-to-one -one conversation with them before I, I went on to do the documentary because yeah. uh, I can just about from a, a journalist that's my actually actual profession. I'm a journalist point of view as well. It's, um, it's yes, we do hang on there and we want for answers. This is how we journalists are. We don't give up. Like we really, you know, hold on to somebody, whether it's a politician or whoever. But in that case, in Afghanistan, I was more sensible only because I thought it is a country they has been a they have been affecting in regards to war for over 40 years. These women are vulnerable. How do I make them open up? By having one-to-one -one chat with them and really long conversations, it really make them feel comfortable. But, but I, however, I must say, um, Caroline, that most of the women that I interviewed, uh, they were quite still strong despite the struggle. They were still very confident and they wanted their voice to be heard. Hence, they saw my film as an opportunity to find their voices again. And I love that phrase, find your voices again, because we all have to be given at least one time, one in a lifetime, a platform to find our voices again. And that's exactly what these women uh, were. I mean, my, I mean, that was my first film. It was screened in, in I think, seven countries. And um, for strong women to come forward or um, for, for many female politicians, including Theresa May, she watched my documentary as well. For her to send me a letter and to say that she, she, she liked the fact that I empower these women, that no matter where we live, or, or we, we still have that connection. And it shows that if, if someone like these female powerful politicians believe in what we do then it can only make us stronger and I'm so happy and proud despite the struggles I made my Afghan diary happen because it was mm. a self-funded project before I filmed it I did approach many people in the industry that I had known to support me financially but none of them really believed in, in my vision and what I really actually wanted to do mm -hmm. and just to, to other beautiful ladies who are, are watching life the film is about uh, Afghan Afghan women who work in the creative sector despite challenges. Like I interviewed two actresses, they all have children, are married, and yet they wear their headscarf and in the mornings they go to the theater and practice and then they come back outside and pretend nothing happened. Because in Kabul, even when I was there, you see Taliban everywhere. So it's quite dangerous. So any woman would feel vulnerable, even for myself, because with me, you could clearly tell that I was raised in the Western world just by the fact how how I walked with my yeah. chest up for mm. us it's pretty normal but for them I was quite confident the way I was walking um down the street despite uh, wearing a burqa and and I'm so grateful that these women uh, came forward despite the struggles because they wanted their voice to be to mm. be heard you know it makes me very proud mm. I think that's that's a really strong theme about having your voices heard and and I was actually, I, I think that kind of brings brings me back to you, actually, Carol, if I could bring you in here because of the work that you're doing, kind of um, amplifying women's voices. And, you know, maybe if we could talk a little bit about how that, how you're amplifying women's voices and also how that can challenge stereotypes as well. Okay. Um, yes, uh, earlier this year before COVID lockdown, oh dear. Mm -hmm. Um, we had one, um, my company had won a, a Royal Society of Literature Award, a Literature Matters Award mm. for our project that was about, that is about um, amplifying the voices of uh, black women playwrights over the age of 45, well really mm. over the age of 50, but hey. Um, and, <laughs> and um, yeah, and it was really important to me because up until the beginning of this year, all of the plays that I had gone to see, you know, that were plays written by black women had been younger black women. So mm -hmm. women around the age of 30, mid thirties. 
And I thought, okay, that's really good. And I'm really enjoying the stories that I'm seeing coming out of these women. And they're telling stories that were bold and were um, impactful. Um, but what about the older women? Where are our stories? And we, and, and the interesting thing for me was every time I went to the theater, the thing I saw was that women who looked like me, who were my kind of age. So mm -hmm. menopausal women were sitting in the theater, watching theater written by younger women, but there was no theater for us. So I gathered together a group of um, black women playwrights, and uh, we have been working on our scripts over the COVID time. And we managed to get uh, two theatres who would support us. One of them is the Young Vic, um, and they're going to be putting on three of the plays. And the other one is the Bush Theatre in Hammersmith, which will put on the other three plays. Mm -hmm. And also at the Bush, we will have um, like a sisters, almost mother, daughter, auntie kind of thing. We, in the Caribbean and in the African cultures, we, women of my age are called auntie. So auntie and, and niece. And I wanted to, so I'm bringing together uh, young women under 35 and women over 45 mm -hmm. uh, playwrights to talk to each other about their careers, about the things that they might be um, afraid of, the things that they're struggling with the things that they're not struggling with, their joys. So it's a, I'm, I want to create a space where um, women of all ages link together because that's something again that I don't see often enough anywhere. Wim, uh, women being encouraged across the age range to come together um, in a creative way. Yeah. Mm. That's so important, that, that kind of crossing the ages. You're nodding there, Emily. What, what, what would you want to say on, on this subject? Uh, the subject of stories for women. Well, the subject group? of, yeah, we're... kind of, well, how, what, how we kind of challenge stereotypes of women of our age group and also uh -huh. how can we bring more women in and how can we talk across generations? Right, okay. So yeah, it just, it makes me think, I just want to give a little bit of background to mm -hmm. my story because um, someone, I forget who was saying it, but someone said something that really resonated with me that I think it was Karen who said that for those of us who've had sort of rocky, uh, journeys through mm -hmm. life, menopause is not, it doesn't seem as traumatic. Mm -hmm. And I can really relate to that because um, as a young, as a younger person, as a younger artist, I was, I, I had a lot of depression, um, mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety. I was, I was not very confident of myself. And, um, and then on top of that, I kind of married late and didn't have kids. So one of the mm -hmm. things that really one of the things that I always wanted to do was have kids and my mom had four kids and, and I thought that was really the thing. That was it. That was, you know, that was going to be what I did. So what happened by not having kids, I wrote this visual narrative called broken eggs, which was about infertility. And mm -hmm. um, by working on making that story and doing that art, I was able to kind of come out on the other side of it. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, it's, it's sort of over. I was able to put it to bed. And what happened was that I'm start, I was, because of my journey, my own particular sort of like rocky path through life, I've been able to really now focus on um, the gift that I've been able to have by being a creative. And all of this other stuff that I didn't do, which I thought was supposed to be what I was doing, I've actually been able to do in the end um, something incredibly fulfilling and that I will be doing for the rest of my life, me, which is making art and making visual narratives and painting and talking to artists. And I'm finding as I get older that there, there are so many women who when they get, when their kids leave, they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of um, bereft in a way, like it's sort of like they have ended right? Because 
And I'm finding that what I'm trying to do with my work is to, to sort of say to everybody, it's not, you're not ending, you're actually just beginning. You're beginning yeah. this incredibly fertile time. Mm. Mm. Certainly, so. yeah. I mean, and, and to bring you in on that, um, Karen, so, um, and slightly shift the question a bit, it's like, what can the creative arts, how can they help uh, women, people going through this particular time of life. So what are your thoughts on that, Karen? I think any time you're, you're going through a stressful time, if you can step away from it, it has to be helpful. Mm. You can get out of yourself, out of your problems. And that's, as I said, a lot of women at that age, the age of children being uh, grown, the age of starting menopause, went back to school. They, mm -hmm. some of them I spoke to, um, well, some of them were, were very sad <laughs> thinking their childbearing days were over and they were worthless now. Others were very ecstatic about it, thinking their sex lives could be wonderful. For those who had poor sex lives before, this gave them a chance to think and to move forward. Many of them chose to leave their marriages, whether they were decided they were gay or not, or whether they discovered they were gay, excuse me, or not. But I spoke to several women who actually divorced, bought themselves like motorhomes and traveled. They did things they never ever would have done with children and with the marriages. And they just found themselves and talk mm. about being creative to, to change everything that's normal for you and go for something different. Got to give them a lot of credit. Mm. A lot of women realize that this is the second half of their life and they can't repeat it. And it's mm. now or never. And that, for, that brings a kind of cre creativity, whether it's with a pencil or a pen, or it's just, um, it's a knowing, it's a being, it's a confidence. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of women in past generations never got to that place. They felt worthless after they got their periods. They weren't needed anymore. What was their purpose in life? And that's very sad. I, I met one woman who was, she was in her 80s and I was at a doctor's appointment and she had come in for a sonogram and she didn't have a prescription. And the nurse said, I'm sorry, we can't do it. The receptionist said, and she started to leave. And she had told me how nervous she was and she'd taken a day from whatever she was doing. And I said to the receptionist, wait a minute, nobody walks in off the street and asks for a pelvic sonogram. The doctor must have told her to come, call him. She couldn't get the doctor on the phone. And again, the woman started to leave. I said, no, no, you're here for this and you're going to have it. We went all the way up, I called the manager, and finally she said, of course, let her have it and, you know, get the paper from the doctor later. And the woman looked at me and she said, I didn't know I had the right to do that. Mm. And to me, that, I think, was the saddest thing I ever heard from a person, from a woman. So mm. hopefully now we're teaching younger women, they do have that right and they do have that ability. And mm -hmm. that's part of my book, the, the letters I get, the emails I get, just making people more aware of who and what they are mm. so it's um yeah it's so time uh, life. Yeah. yeah and time and a, a change with new generations so it is kind of it is shifting now very definitely i think and mm -hmm. maybe um Arzu, could i bring you in here um because obviously the women that you spoke to and you've talked to us about this evening so uh for a number of them being a creative person was quite a risk but have you found that creativity is something that has also given uh women in afghanistan or the people you've come across in afghanistan given them a kind of a strength or um a, a sense of something in their lives that they really want to pursue um i think not just in Afghanistan, I think where, wherever you live, when you're able to do what you love, it will give you mm. strength mm. and vice versa. It's, yeah. just, I think it's just simple as that, not just in Afghanistan. And those women who do, I would call it secretly, do what they love and what they are passionate about. Um, my goodness, I have so much admiration 
and for all these women, how they pursue their goals and dreams. I mean, I, I have always said this and I will always say it until my last breath, probably, that the only thing that keeps us going, especially as women, because we can be very vulnerable at times, you know, whether it's your period, whether it's menopause, whether you want to have a child, you cannot have a child, you do want to have a child or you're not sure about this, you're not sure. We, we, we women tend to overthink a lot of things way more than men do, which doesn't make life easier. And on top of living in a country where you, you can't sort of make your own choices, but these women who have the courage and who wear in my film, and um, they are sort of an example for all the women, not just in the Muslim countries, of Afghanistan, but everywhere. If they can do it, um, Caroline, so can we. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I think that's a very, very powerful message from their point of view, if they can somehow pursue it uh, and keeping it a secret and being creative. And, and, and in Afghanistan, it's like in most countries, um, even in Germany, it used to be that way. Your parents would rather wa want, uh, want a girl to become a doctor or a lawyer than her daughter becoming a model or an actress. It would be, mm. be a big deal. And in Afghanistan, it's even to, to another extent, another extreme. So, yeah. so if you are going to decide to become a creative person, whether it's acting, whether it's, it's hosting a show or anything, um, until you make it, you will, you will have to make a secret out of your dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly. So, I mean, in that kind of way, you know, it feels like creativity has such an important role to pe play in people's lives. Um, maybe coming to you, Emily, what, what more do you think we could be doing to support that creativity? Oh, um, you mean just with everybody? Well, Creative. with everyone, but I mean, you know, thinking specifically, I suppose, about um, people at menopause age, at midlife in this later part of life. But, you know, right. maybe there's, there are things that do apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess in terms of creativity, I mean, I think what, what is hard for... I think it's hard for people who are not creatives to kind of open up and see the world. Like basically being an artist means you're really observing everything around you all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You're finding different ways to kind of get that out. You're finding different ways to tell the story. And I think mm -hmm. what would be helpful maybe for particularly women who are older, um, who are going through all this stuff is to write to learn how to write about their feelings about these things, to learn how to draw their observations about it. I mean, I, I think the more that we can encourage people to, who are not artists, to engage in that way of thinking, yeah. um, the, I think the healthier the world community will be, literally. I think the more creative we are as a human race, the more the less kind of strife and horribleness there's gonna be out there. So I think investing in, you know, ways to do, to get people involved in that kind of, those kind of activities, do workshops, do kind of seminars where you take people on, um, you know, sort of jaunts into the countryside to kind of write and draw, like sort of reconnect with what we as humans sort of did, you know, 40,000 years ago, we were drawing on cave walls before we could write because we had the impulse to make an image. Mm -hmm. And um, we sort of need to reconnect with that very human impulse, which I think is beaten out of us at a very early age. Yeah. I mean, what would you like to add to that, Carol? I mean, that's a very important point about education, I think. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, I yes, I completely agree, Emily, completely agree. I think that um, what's in, what feels important to me as, as a woman and, uh, and looking at creativity, it was one of the things that, that, keep, that came to mind when I was listening to you, Emily, was my mum. My mum used to make um, all of my dresses when I was younger. And then I got to that age where it's like, no, 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 no. I want shop, thank you. 
And then I, we, we came right back round again. And as I got older, I only wanted my mum's clothes. And so my mum was making clothes for me way into her 70s. And that was her outlet, her creative outlet. And watching her do that, again, has there's something for me about getting permission as a black woman to be creative. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly as a black menopausal woman to be yeah. creative, it's having those images of my mother and women like my mother um, in my head are part of what drive me forward. And so part of what I want to do is, is, is create the space for women who maybe have never picked up a pen to write anything before, create yeah. a space where they can do that too, where they can discover um, that really, they, that this thing that's been inside them for so long that they have been pushing aside for um, bringing up children, pushing aside for being married, pushing aside for, you know, even their girlfriend, pushing yeah. aside for somebody else, saying to themselves, you know what, I want to do this for me. Mm. And taking the, the energy, the power um, of the menopause, because to me, it is a powerful time, taking mm. the power of the menopause and using that power to propel their creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, before yeah, yeah. we, yeah, yeah, do you want to add, Karen? Years ago in the States, we had sewing bees women got together and not making eye contact, they were able to talk about anything they wanted to talk about and they mm -hmm. did. And then we started with um, work and women were out to work and the sewing circles disappeared. And then mm -hmm. in the 70s, there was a, a, a pull, consciousness raising groups came about yeah. because again, women were feeling the, the need for other women. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing for menopause and for every stage of our life is we need to talk to each other. Yeah. I live by three ahas, and one of them is nobody knows what you're thinking unless you say the words. Women didn't know about orgasm. Women didn't, they were clueless about so much because mm -hmm. they didn't share their information. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I try to get out anytime I do a talk. You can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. Don't listen to anybody who says no. And make a list of positive people in your life and the negative people in your life and stay with the positive ones. Mm -hmm. And especially as you get older, your, mm -hmm. your circle of friends will probably shrink a little, but you find you don't need that vast group. You need a few. Yeah. And it just, it gives you the, the time to do more for yourself mm -hmm. rather than feeling you have to be everything for everyone mm -hmm. and go with the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right. So right, um, yeah, a lot of what you're saying chimes with me as well. Um, I'd just like to say uh, out for our attendees, if there's mm -hmm. anyone who would like to ask a question, did you want to put something into the Q&A or um, see who we have here? Have you got any questions for our, for our panelists? Well, have a think while we, we talk a bit more. We're, um, we're going to, well, I wanted to just think a little bit more about how, how kind of using creativity might be able to help break down some of the taboos. And I suppose it's something in a way interesting you kind of touched on there, Karen, talking about the sewing bees, you know, that so in a way making a, creative space can can help to break down taboos because it's something where people where people feel they can talk um are there ways like that or are there more overt ways that we can break down some of the taboos around menopause maybe yeah, emily you might speak about that well i think just as women i mean as we are getting older i mean I have had an amazing turnaround in terms of my own health. I had a hip replacement two years ago and I'm, I was only 53 when it happened or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it sort of blew my mind 
And before it happened, I couldn't really walk because I was in so much pain. And now I'm totally healed. <laughs> I'm healed. And, you know, there's something about, you know, age is not, an, I mean, the number of your age is not who you are. And I think disconnecting, you know, now I'm 50, 56 years old. Well, that means that I'm going to go like, I want to climb like the highest mountain in the world. I want to kayak down like the biggest, you know, whitewater rafts in the world. Nothing is going to stop me. And I think a lot of people are kind of stopped, especially women, are kind of stopped by this idea of what age is. And I think the more we kind of disassociate from that and just kind of forge your own path, the happier everybody's going to be. That's been my experience. Yeah, certainly. We have a question from uh, Rachel Weiss, who set up the menopause cafe movement and is actually another contributor to the book. So Rachel, I'll just read out your question. Um, at the menopause festival, we find that women try new forms of creativity to help them make sense of their menopausal experience. They may not have the words to converse, but through workshops on dance, on poetry, on sculpture, on photography, uh, we give them a space to experiment and express. Do the panelists know of other meeting places where people experiencing menopause can use creativity to explore it? So are there spaces? Yes, Karen. There's a group, I, I'm not very familiar with them, but they're called the Red Hats. And they're older women and they wear red and purple and they just have fun days. They go out looking outrageous and because they're in a group, they don't care and they're able to share and they're able to come together. And I think for women, not everyone needs that, but women who are timid, it's never too late to have a, a happy childhood. And they go out and they prove it. Yeah. So um, yeah, either Emily or Carol or Azu, have you come across, I suppose, groups that encourage exploring feelings, I suppose, whether that's around menopause or other times of life in through creativity? Hmm. Not really. Mm, interesting. No, I think that's why I um, am working to create these spaces because I'm creating the spaces that I, I see aren't there. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, certainly. Definitely. So we kind of, we need more, there is, so creativity has a real potential for helping people through different kinds of experiences. Um, as we age, it's no bar to creativity. I mean, I'm just kind of repeating back to you some, I suppose, the messages that the things we've talked about, there's no bar to creativity. In fact, if one is more settled in oneself, it can actually, there can be like an increase in creativity as well. Um, so I suppose it would be good to, to yeah. yeah, Arzu, you wanted to say something. Yes, um, I hope it's okay to share that, Caroline, you know yes. it already. Uh, to all the other beautiful ladies, um, I have uh, recently released my first TV show, which mm. is uh, about um, people who feel vulnerable and women who work towards mm. women's rights and equality. And I have already, we have already filmed three episodes. So um, yes, it's mainly in German, but in the coming months, once this COVID-19 sort of, um, you know, um, improves, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to invite English speaking guests too. And this is why, in case you are wondering, I have been making notes because okay. this is a topic that is very close to my heart. And I would love um, all of you to sort of keep in touch with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, because I would like to in, in, invite uh, inspiring women such as all of yourselves uh, on the show to, to talk about this topic, menopause. And it's been really helpful for me through all these conversations to, to sort of find out from, from your point of view. So that's been really, really helpful because it's given me a hint towards other ideas and, mm. and women that I want to uh, approach. Like I said, this is a show that is um, very, very close to my heart. I've worked from scratch to make it a reality. And the first episode was quite successful to my surprise because um, women's mm -hmm. rights and equality is something many uh, people don't, don't, don't perhaps like to talk about, even in Germany, even though mm. people 
are quite open-minded, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that people like to talk about it or a woman coming telling about their life and st stories and, and how they've overcome everything. So um, it's definitely something that I would like to this topic to tap on and and I would love all of you to sort of keep in contact with me and, and once obviously the timing is right um, to sort of talk further about it and sort of discuss it on the show, I think that would be brilliant. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. I mean, I think actually that is one of the things about these conversations is they really have brought people together and lots of the people that, that have been part of these panel discussions, it's like they've, they've sort of said, oh, can we keep in touch? So it does feel important to have these sorts of networks and, and I think international networks as well and networks where, you know, there's... I don't know, it's sort of a shared, a shared sort of interest, but where everyone is bringing their own talents and their own perspectives to it as well. I think mm. that's, that's been one of the really amazing things that has kind of come through doing these panels. So I just wondered if we could maybe finish off with um, each of you, if there aren't any other questions. And I hope, Rachel, that that answered your question for you. Um, so it does sound like there is we do need more spaces where people can be creative and to make those sorts of spaces. Um, so for maybe final words, Karen, do you want to start us off? What, you know, what do you, have you, what would you like, what's the message you would like to put out about creativity, age and um, women? What would okay, you like to say? Just a little uh, add on to answer Rachel's question. Yeah, um, most of the colleges have women's centers. You mm. can just go in, hang out. They have le reading material, brochures, uh, lists of meetings, things like that. Just if people are looking for some place to connect, and you don't have to be a student at the college. Mm. Um, I was going to say add something else, and it's. Can you come back to me? Yeah, I'll come back to you. So Emily, one of these pauses. Yeah, that's it. We all know those. <laughs> um, so yeah, Emily, final words, what would you like? What kind of message would you like to put across about creativity? Um, so I think, well, first of all, I just want to say one thing is that I, that I got an idea from talking about everybody here. I think what I would like to do is hold sort of workshops or seminars with women to just tell their stories. Mm. Um, because I think a lot of people yeah don't think their stories are worth telling. Yeah. Um, but everyone's story is worth telling. And I think that, you know, if we can sort of get that message out there that, you know, everything is, in, everything is pretty much, there's all, everything is interesting. Yeah. And as long as you imbue it with passion and, um, and intensity, right? Like yeah. looking at the corner of a room can be, can be an amazing experience. So I think people need to really focus on my message is that the more people start really engaging in their lives instead of in the minutia that is kind of forced down our throats every day by whatever, um, and kind of push all that aside and just look mm -hmm. at the world they're living in and kind of experience it with gratitude. I think that can be like a creative endeavor. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Emily. Yes, yeah, so, so true about everyone's story is important. Definitely, definitely. So Karen, if you, what would you yeah, like to add then? I can't believe I got this. <laughs> I always had a secret dream of being a writer, but I didn't know anything mm -hmm. about writing or writers. And in college, I got back my first English paper and had a C on it. And I went up to the professor and I said, what could I do to improve my writing? And he said, quote, honey, some people are writers and some aren't, and you're not a writer. Mm. I believed him oh. and I didn't pick up a pen for more than 15 years. Yeah. Oh. Now it's my first book was sold at a bidding war. I mean, it's just, so mm. what I tell people is never listen to anyone who says you can't. It yeah. might take you longer than another person, it might take less, but anyone can do whatever they want to, you know, live in reason. Mm. And just feeling, get, getting that bit of um, an aha okay, I can pick up a pen. It doesn't matter if I don't do a good job with my picture or with my story. It's a start. 
Yeah. Once that confidence comes, I think the creative creativity automatically comes because we want more, we see more, we're mm. aware of more. Mm. I think so many people are held back by that fear of failure. So mm. I think if we can turn it around to like being, well, I'm a beginner at this. So, you know, I'll have to try and, you know, the first few times I do this, it's not going to be very good, perhaps. But, you know, it's, it's the starting it. The starting it is so important. Can I, yeah. can I add something to that? Yeah. Because I, I think that's when in my classes, when I teach students, I tell them that there is absolutely, this is not a place for preciousness. And this is not a place for, I don't really care if you know how to draw. I don't care about anything. But you just have to do it without caring about it. Just get it out, right? Mm -hmm. And just and you get it out through your mistakes, or what, we don't even call them mistakes. We just call it sort of exploration. And mm -hmm. keep getting stuff out. And the more you get out, the the more it's. I hate this whole idea of kind of the preciousness of it all. Yeah. Right. Like, the idea of that everything has to be a certain way or it has to look in a certain way. It's just so stultifying. Mm. Certainly. We're reaching the end of our time, but I wonder if, Carol, have you got a final thing that you would like to say, something you'd like to put across to people about, about creativity? Just do it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Just do it. Don't worry about what it looks like don't worry about what you sound like if singing's your thing don't worry about your poem don't just do it do it yeah. for the love of it because actually the very best art comes out of the absolute joy and love of it yeah in yeah. in my book on writing i list all of the famous authors and how many rejections they've had yes 104 rejections 84 rejections 300 rejections and if they stopped one rejection earlier, they'd never have made it. Yeah. So they yeah. just didn't quit. And that's what it's about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so true. I would like to thank you all and thank our attendees as well. Um, it's been a great discussion. Really, really interesting. Uh, we'll be putting it up on YouTube. Um, for other people to catch up with but thank you all it's been a real pleasure a real joy to be able to have this conversation tonight and it sort of feels like it would be nice to go on and just sort of have a really informal conversation so maybe we can do that sometime just get together you know when it's not going out live or being filmed or something but it's been so good to talk to all of you thank you everyone and thank I hope you, you have a good uh, rest of your day and evening so, thank you. Thanks nice very to meet much. You. Yeah. Take care.